Um, we heard this morning how financial regulation is being uh, moved substantially to the European level, if you accept that financial journalists have a, uh, a role in overseeing that regulatory structure, then you've got to question whether, whether that's a problem. But I think behind your question is a <clears throat> another set of questions which we haven't had time to speak about at the conference, which is to do with financial um, journalism and financial media in other countries. The, the project I mentioned yesterday that I'm conducting at the moment, interviewing financial journalists and editors um, in London and New York, I'm doing a, the next phase at the moment. I'm, I'm analysing some research that I did in uh, Hong Kong as a way of looking at a, another market. And if you, if you pose the question of the future role of financial journalism, I think you also have to look at financial journalism in, in other countries. And what you see when you look in emerging markets I think are some very different approaches to financial journalism um, and uh, much less very often of a sophisticated sense of conflict of interest, for example, uh, in terms of the effectiveness of, of regulation, um, particularly in, in the Chinese language media. And if you ask, pose the question about whether there is a, a, a place globally in the future uh, governance structure for the informal oversight of the media, You've got, to pose the, po you've got to say that, the, that it's a question mark, really, if you look at the role of financial media elsewhere. It can go in two ways. Financial media can go into the private sector, not really taking any notice of any broader ethical responsibility dealing with uh, conflicts of interest or, indeed, during dealing with this kind of broader watchdog role. So in, uh, uh, I think we need to know, understand more about... Uh, emerging markets and the role of the financial business media. And we also need to uh, help emerging markets to develop their ethical framework um, and uh, train financial journalists. Um, I'm loath to sort of give one more question because I do want to wrap it up, <coughs> but I'm, I'm handing this over, okay? And you're going to keep it very focused for our last question. And then I do want to actually come back to the topic of what we're talking about to today. Um, and wrap it up with you two about, you know, the green shoots that we have here in terms of what we can do for the next generation of journalists that are coming. But uh, I'll put it in his hands here for the moment <laughs> and trust it. Yeah. I guess the economic mess we are currently in, we all agree that it's based, uh, that it's the result of irresponsible loose monetary policy over the last 10 or 15 years, yeah. Um, I'm wondering, and now we're all looking for solutions, and I'm now asking especially mainstream media, I mean, it's a different side on the new media on the web, yeah, we have this discussion there. Why is there such a dogmatic exclusion of the return to the gold standard? Gold has been the universally accepted currency for 6,000 years that worked. For the last 300 years we worked with unbacked fiat currencies and not a single one of them did not devalue to zero. The dollar is 96 years old, 96% loss. Thank you. The I think I'm taking that more the, of a statement. The, the you can all comment was on responsible it. responsible for the pro propagation of the Great Depression from what we know. If we would, the Great Depression wouldn't have been great, so great had countries not fixed their currencies with gold. Gold was not the solution. Gold was a problem. And getting away from gold was a solution. It was not the right solution, the way we're doing this. But going back to gold is absolutely not going to solve any of our problems. What I'd like to do, if it's all right with the okay. panel, is sort of move that along. And, and thank you for that statement, where that's the category I'm putting that last comment in. <laughs> um, we do have to, to look ahead and see what we can do and really sort of examine where we are now and what can be put in place that actually can maybe just help get us to the next step, even though the next step for the next year or two could be a real tough one. So if I can just ask you to have a quick think on that one. And um, Dean, where do you think is, what can actually help financial journalists get it right at least in the interim now until we move through this? Oh man, that is, you know, it's such <laughs> the million a... million dollar question. It's Sorry. really hard because uh, um, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's like trying to fix your car while you're going 65 miles an hour. Okay, you put know. the brakes on a little bit then. Yeah, I mean, but you, you know, you're, they're, they're going, they're in the middle of this crazy transition and trying to cover this, this, um, this big story. Um, I guess one thing is, uh, you know, to, I think, you know, and first of all, the, the, the artificial, uh, uh, this debate about, you know, print and online, it's, it's it's uh, 
it's um, it's 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 not relevant. I mean, it, it'll it'll all be what it is, and and all are valuable that type of thing. I think uh, I think um, in the states particularly, um, uh, uh, there's got to be some pushback from the press, uh, which has been sort of under ideological assault for 30 years from from the right wing and. And uh, they, and to the point where even gathering of facts is 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 uh, is, is, is argued to be a, a uh, an indication of bias, and um, I think the the press needs to sort of um, um, uh, get you know sort of recover from its shell shock, and you know dust itself off and stand up, uh, look to the long term, be confident, uh, invest in the future. Um, believe in and, and basically be, believe in what you're doing. You know, if you you know you should believe in in the, you know in the, in the first and foremost in the importance of journalism and the importance of your role in, in conveying, conveying important and relevant information uh, to the public and uh, sort of uh, be 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 brave and forthright. Uh, be my best guess and be confident in, in um, and. Uh, and, and you know, and, be, and believe in yourself enough to 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 invest in the long term. And Wolfgang, we don't we're not asking you for the solution, but a guidance for for the journalists. For the journalists, I think that what journalists should do is uh, to acquaint themselves with finance and eco the economics of finance. Uh, I'm surprised how few, little financial journalists actually know about the technicalities of finance. And I think what they need to do is not just understanding how those instruments work, because that's relatively easy. There are lots of books written about it, but actually understand some of the broader economic issues of finance. And you know, read books, take courses, get trained in a professional, in a, in a, in a, in a proper way. That's very hard because this isn't just you know economics 101. This is more. It takes more than six months to do, and it, it needs it needs some you know you're covering one of the most sophisticated part of the universe. Uh, and therefore, therefore, you know, you need to be up to speed with the stuff that that that, that, that is happening there, and that just isn't. There just are not. Uh. Right. Yeah. There was a time when it was maybe a niche market that you could cover and, and think it was something just specialist, but now it's it's almost gone mainstream. Yeah, it's not you just really markets, need to know but what it's doing. also you know bubbles. You know, the history of all there are historical aspects. There are there are technical aspects about bubbles. There are psychological aspects of bubbles. Uh, so you know, and there are regulatory aspects of bubbles. So you need to have an understanding uh, that is just way beyond. Just the narrow field of a market and finance, but you know a broader economic uh, understanding about interactions of markets and interactions between markets and the real economy. Uh, you know that is significantly uh, significantly more complex than than what most people are, what most. So, Steve, are. when you start your your course in September, this new financial journalism course, what can you sort of bring with it? What do you think are the key things you're going to be focusing on? Well, I think Wolfgang's absolutely right. What we, I think what we need is for people to understand both the mechanics, but more importantly, the context and the history of these decisions, mm -hmm. because there is an institutional history to this, both for the regulators and, and the financial institutions, which is important in explaining this context. People need to also develop and understand the importance of sources. And the third thing people need, and I think, again, has been really lacking in a lot of the coverage, is actual financial numeracy. We get talk a lot about literacy and training. There isn't really enough training in numeracy and understanding the numbers, because you can derive a lot by reading out data which is there, but which many people really don't understand or appreciate the significance of. And just three things I think we need to avoid, three dangers. One is this danger of polarization, as we have in the US, where some people just look at some media, others don't believe it. And basically, what it leads to is a diminished trust, both in the media and in the fact that there can be a civilized public debate. We're having the debasement both of the political and the financial debate. I think that's a big risk. The second risk is if we end up with a certain the information divided between paid for information that the only the financial elites and investors find out about and much weaker, less information that's available to the general public. I think we have to avoid that polarization between the specialists paid for information and the um, information that's available to the public. And the third thing I think we need to do is to understand that we do le live in a globalized world. And we really need to raise the standard of information that's available in developing and emerging